Hello and welcome to the second uh, IP Espresso podcast from the Southeast Asia Intellectual Property Help Desk for European SMEs. Um, do grab a coffee, um, sit back well, whilst we take a, a look at how to protect your company's intellectual property in Southeast Asia. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, so the Southeast Asia IP SME Help Desk is a project funded by the European Commission uh, and it's there to provide information and first line support to small, medium enterprises um, about protecting and exploiting their intellectual property when they are active in the region. Now, these services are free and confidential and open to all SMEs based in the European Union, as well as Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. Uh, and we are also delighted to confirm that we are now able to support SMEs that are based in Turkey, Ukraine, and North Macedonia. Um, now, our team of IP experts, which are, are based in Vietnam in the region, can answer any questions you may have about intellectual property in the region. Um, and our website has a wide collection of fact sheets and case studies uh, about managing your IP in the region. So that website is www.sea-iphelpdesk.eu. Now, as I said, this is the second of a regular series of podcasts that we're producing, one episode every two months, uh, in which we will dive into different aspects of intellectual property in Southeast Asia. Now, I do recommend you follow us on social media uh, just to see when our next episodes will appear. Um, and we are delighted today that this episode is being produced in collaboration with Unifab, uh, which is a French public interest organization that promotes the international protection of intellectual property and fights against counterfeiting. Now, this makes them the perfect partner to talk about today's topic, which is e-commerce and online enforcement in Southeast Asia. So without any further delay, I would like to introduce our two guests. Thank you for bearing with me as I went through that introduction this morning. Nick, Remy. Um, Nick, if you go first, I, I understand you're based in Bali. <laughs> yes, my name is Nick Redfern. I'm head of enforcement at the IP firm Rouse, which is a global IP firm. I'm based in Indonesia, and uh, we specialize in anti-counterfeiting and anti-piracy work, uh, particularly across the Asia-Pac region. Super. And I mean, maybe not as glamorous as Bali, but still, Paris is, is a beautiful city. It's not bad. It's not bad. Yes. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, so I'm Remy Mulemba, I'm managing the public and legal affairs of UNIFAB, so you introduced it quite well, the French Association for the Protection and Defense of IP Rights. Very good. Well, thank you both very much for joining us today. Um, so we're looking at e-commerce, um, and what I wanted to do was to help our viewers was just to set the scene a little bit. Um, and we've seen an explosion of e-commerce. I, I saw a study uh, that I read yesterday saying that global GDP um, e-commerce accounts for about 30% of that today, which is quite a, an incredible figure when we think about it. Um, so, of course, with all of this business, with all of this money flowing uh, around the, the, the Southeast Asia region in particular, there are problems. There's counterfeiting, there's intellectual property being stolen. Um, maybe, Nick, can you tell me a little bit from your point of view about the scale and how things have changed in recent years? Sure. Well, um, I think everyone knows that most counterfeit goods come from China. It varies depending on the product, but around 75% of goods, particularly in Southeast Asia, based on our research, come from China. Of course, in certain sectors like electronics, it's a lot higher. Maybe in clothing and toys, it might be an awful lot lower. Um, so that's the starting point. That's always been the case because China is the world's workshop. So, of course, everything, everything tends to be produced there. Um, what has happened in recent years, and particularly accelerated by the COVID pandemic, is that e-commerce across Southeast Asia has boomed. So we have e-commerce platforms like Lazada, Shopee, uh, Bukalapak and Tokopedia in Indonesia. These are enormous channels for the goods trade in Southeast Asia. And there's been a massive acceleration of the air freighting and uh, through logistics hubs and delivery, just in time delivery into Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, all across Southeast Asia from China. Um, you can probably say that is now the predominant channel for the delivery of counterfeit goods in the region. So that brings a lot of new challenges with us. Yeah, with it. You know, how do we address that? Um, how do we collect the data on that? And what do we do about it? And we'll obviously talk a bit more about that in a moment. Yeah, super. Thanks to guests. We've got quite a quite a challenge here. Remy, Unifab is, is particularly interested in protecting French intellectual property, some of the most famous brands in the world, uh, 
have their handbags and their perfumes copied. Um, I'm just wondering uh, how big a concern is this for the French uh, industry? Yeah, exactly. I totally relate to uh, what Nick just said. Uh, and maybe to give you, a, I already, uh, we always like to start with some figures uh, in order to set the scene a little bit. And uh, at Unifem, we made two studies recently uh, on the problem of online infringements of IP rights. The first one has been realized um, amongst like French consumers, and it shows up that 37% of French consumers have already bought a counterfeit product without knowing it on the internet. So this is quite massive. And this proportion of, um, let's say, deceived buyers is higher for young people, um, age 15 to 18. So it hires up to 45%. So I think it really shows that consumers need to be more uh, vigilant when uh, making purchases, um, especially on the net, uh, on the internet, um, that that has become, uh, as Nick said, um, the let's say the number one uh, key distribution channel for um, counterfeit goods. The second figure that can be interesting is a study that we made last year internally uh, amongst twenty five of, uh, of our member companies um, on one year, um, and on one year only on different e commerce platforms and social media, our twenty five member companies have. Uh, notified and taken down more than 32.2 million um, illicit listings. So it is quite massive. And you can imagine if this study has been made amongst our 200 um, uh, member companies, but also internationally. So this is yeah very, very important. And uh, it is an issue that we need to um, actually take into uh, account. That's that's quite a figure, uh, thirty-two and a half million. You said yes. yes. I mean, that's that's yes. it's hard to get your head around you know numbers like that at times. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that that reveals the, the scale of the problem here. Um, and, and I suppose that, you know, all of us being locked away during COVID uh, has kind of accelerated this. Would you agree with that, Nick, that actually the fact that we were all purchasing online, that we were getting things delivered, that we weren't able to go to the shops um, has exacerbated this problem? Exactly. Yeah, we've seen an acceleration in this over the last three to four years. Um, I, can, I can give you just a couple of uh, figures from, uh, let's just take, if I just take Indonesia, um, a couple of brands, three brands that we've been looking at. One is a household name, I won't mention who. Um, in one platform in Indonesia, they can find 10,000 counterfeit listings. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of small brands, not household names. Um, one of them said they found two and a half thousand across, I think, three platforms in Indonesia. This is not a well-known brand. You wouldn't know it. Right. Yeah, uh, so that's the sort of that's what a small business can face thousands on just a few platforms in one country. Now, okay, we can always say listings are one thing. So what's behind that? Well, another company, also not a huge household name, but a, a mid-sized brand, they did an analysis of all of their products, and this is a personal care product. They bought samples mm -hmm. and did the analysis. They found that nearly a hundred percent of the products available on Shopee were counterfeit, and on Lazada it was something like sixty to eighty percent. So this is the level of problem when you get down to the macro level in countries. That's why when you add all these numbers together, you get the sheer scale that Remy was talking about worldwide. Yes, um, I, I, and I think that this is different, isn't it? Because this is all visible. We used to deal with counterfeiting, which was you used to go to that market. Uh, there was the Vietnamese market in Warsaw, I remember, where you could go and find any product that you were looking for at, at a knockdown price. Um, but it's different today, isn't it? It's uh, it's now all online and, and the merchants are, are putting themselves out there. Absolutely. In 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 the past, uh, a, a business would need to actually travel or their distributor would need to report back that they had uh, found something in the market or maybe a sales team. And, and you know, year in years gone by, getting that information back to an IP owner's headquarters for them to consider what to do about it was a long and time consuming process. Right now, because most businesses are either trading online themselves or they're at least looking at what is happening online, they can see that back at headquarters. And, you know, as a result of that, there is now a whole new industry of service providers growing up that are supporting brand owners uh, in, 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 deliver, in doing the surveys of e-commerce platforms around the world, from Amazon to Facebook Marketplace to all of the ones in Southeast Asia, and trying to analyze what listings are counterfeit, how to identify them, and then if they're identified as counterfeit, um, requesting a takedown 
by the e-commerce platform. And under the, the basic principles of uh, what's called secondary liability law, uh, the, the first person who's infringing is the person selling, of course. The second person person who's assisting and the platforms are essentially secondarily liable if they don't remove something after they've had notice that it's infringing yeah so, so there, there is a process there that you many companies would hire one of these software houses to who would provide software that would do all of this and using a great big dashboard they can help work out how to remove quantities of listings yeah, I see. I, I, again, I have some memories of me walking down East Street Market in Southeast London. I don't know if you know it. And uh, there would be these these guys that were there with these little suitcases. They could close very quickly and run off at the moment that a police officer appeared um, uh, in the market. So we've moved on a lot from that now. But the scale has really exploded as well. And, and Amy, we're here to talk about SMEs today. But just, I mean, SMEs don't necessarily have the resources the, the, the manpower, the budget necessary to potentially counter this efficiently. I just wonder, can you give us some, some examples of how the biggest companies in the world are, are confronting this problem to see if there's any lessons to be learned from that? Yeah, yeah, of course. I think first thing first, it is already very difficult and we already talked about it when we come back, for example, on the dangers of buying counterfeit goods on the internet. Um, we can particularly point out, I think, that the counterfeiters are often part of let's say international organized crime networks this is a reality um, that are prepared to do anything to to make money so when someone buys a counterfeit on the internet i think there are some let's say three scenarios that can be um that can be seen the first one is maybe in the best case that the buyer of counterfeit receives a product that just does not match or conform to what he or she has expected uh, in terms of designs, in terms of functionality, in terms of color, whatever. Um, a second option would be it is, let's say, less um, less pleasant is that you can receive nothing. Um, or the, th the, th the third one, uh, in most serious cases, that account features will, in addition to selling you nothing, um, steal all your personal and bank details that you left during your purchase. So this is something that I think we all need to, to, to have in mind. And of course, it is super difficult to come back to your question, even for big companies, biggest companies that have the budget and sufficient resources to have a full protection of their IP rights online and worldwide, um, because they also face off the same counterfeiters that are really true professionals who know perfectly well how to fool the consumers by posting ads that appear to be perfectly legal um, and trustworthy, um, but they're also professionals in um, understanding let's say the legislations and regulations in force in different countries and they're able actually to um to, to grasp the potential loopholes in each of the systems so this is very very difficult even if you have a team of let's say a hundred of people actually doing brand protection um, for your company this is already a challenge a second challenge for me is of course knowing the different business models of uh, online platforms that are very, very different from one to another. I'm not only talking about uh, uh, Southeast Asia, but in Southeast Asia, you have a very different types of platforms that work very differently. That makes the understanding of how the platform works very difficult. The notification and takedown processes are often not harmonized, which makes us not super user friendly for a big company. So you can imagine that an SME for an SME where Sometimes and quite often, let's say the CEO needs to handle um, all the tasks for his company from the financial staff to administrative to legal and maybe counterfeiting. So this is a big, big, big um, issue. Uh, uh, and we can very well understand And we have some SMEs at Unifab that actually come to Unifab because they need some resources, they need some help, they need to discuss with bigger companies, they need some advices. Um, and we're here for that. Yeah, very good. That's that's very interesting. I, I just take a little step back just here. So let, let's say we've got a, a fictional SME, uh, Nick, and it's 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 looking to 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 you know move into the Southeast Asian region. Uh, what's the first step steps they should take to make sure they can protect their intellectual property? What do they need to do? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean the starting point obviously is to make sure your rights are registered for the country in question. Mm -hmm. um, without registered rights, you almost certainly cannot get something removed from an e-commerce platform. Then there is a process when you spot a listing of a counterfeit good, you can submit a notice. As Remy says, the problem is 
there'll be local language on some of these platforms. The procedures will be slightly complicated um, and may not be very user friendly. Some of them are not just have not got very efficient systems. Some of them are relatively new. They maybe have only been formed a couple of years, some of these platforms, um, and others may not be very helpful just, just as a general thing. Um, so actually going through that process of filing that notice, uh, making sure the listing is removed and that it doesn't just pop up again later is one of the challenges. But of course, listings are only one part of this. The actual person selling the counterfeit goods, the merchant himself, is really the primary infringer here. So you start to have to think about doing this in two ways. One is you want to remove the visibility of counterfeit goods. And as I say, many companies will hire an outside company to do that surveying, uh, pulling together all of the all of the listings and trying to help you pick out the counterfeit ones from the genuine ones. And you know, mid-sized companies often use those as well. But SMEs, there might be challenges budget-wise, I and mean, you'd have to negotiate hard with one of those companies to try to get yourself a, a a survey or system that would work to the sort of budget you've got to spend on this. But of course. Dealing with the adverts is just dealing with the adverts. That's not targeting the counterfeit goods, which are still being made in China, still being shipped to Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, wherever in, in the region, and have got to be targeted separately. And of course, one of the huge challenges is the costs of law enforcement. If you start thinking about filing cases with the police against counterfeit goods, you're going to talk about spending a lot of money. You'll need to hire local lawyers. You'll need to think about you know, uh, what the documentary requirements are. Filing cases in complicated court systems on the other side of the world is usually more expensive than doing, doing it at home. So there are some intrinsic complexity issues made worse by the fact, as Remy says, these platforms are running different systems and it can be quite a challenge for, us, for an SME to actually embark on such a program. I'm sure, yes, I can imagine the challenges there. I mean, when I try to cancel my Times newspaper subscription, it's lost in 17 links through and, uh, and I can't actually ever do that, it seems, I've given up. <laughs> um, Remy, just to, again, I mean, your organisation is about kind of pooling these resources and providing this the, the, the services, much like the, the, the IP help desk is doing as well. Is that, you know, one of the best solutions for SMEs is just to engage with organisations like Unifab and the IP help desk? And to just you know learn from each other the the, the case studies the, the the examples that people have lived through. Yeah, I I, I definitely think so. Um, in terms of solutions, of course, benefiting from what regional IP or anti counterfeiting associations or national associations can bring is super super important. Uh, first, in terms of networking, um, it, it can be a bit uh, simple to say that, but the share of best practices with other members uh, that can be of the same sector of activity. Uh, then the one of your company um, is super important in order to know who to best work with, um, who is more competent in this region on this topic, on this type of rights. Um, in terms of lobbying opportunities, also I think it's super important. If I talk about Unifab, we're actually the single association in France that has, um, uh, in terms of IP, a direct contact with the French government, with French legislators. So it's super important for them as um, Unifab being sort of the expert uh, on the field to bring up the issues our members can meet and the uh, and the issues that our members can meet are also the ones of the SMEs. So in order to benefit from the network, from the whole group, from the from the experience of largest companies, historical companies, uh, it's super super important to know actually what to do first because in this big jungle, um, you, you can be a bit afraid of like all those platforms. Uh, which one to look first? Um, um, where do I have some counterfeited items of my uh, of my products? Um, on which platform is Southeast Asia uh, a problem for me? Um, all those questions can be actually asked and uh, and answered um, in an association in a, any type of organization that can help. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's 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 very interesting, Remy. I think we're, we're, you're getting onto a topic that that I wanted to cover, which is this uh, engaging with the local place, engaging with the local uh, regulators in this space. Uh, now, again, for an SME, I, I know that's a challenge. But Nick, do you have examples of you seeing this work where you're able to engage with Indonesian authorities, things like this, and to see progress and to see them taking steps? Yes, I think this is something which has increased 
in popularity amongst brand owners in the last few years. Um, it's not specifically connected to e-commerce, but I think the, the, the greater understanding of the scale of counterfeiting globally, the fact that there is data, the sort of data that Remy gave earlier on, that is now available by organizations such as his, that is, that is presented, has increased the understanding about the problem here. Um, and if you are trying to sell goods around the world, it is one of the things you've got to deal with, no matter whether you're the largest multinational, the smallest SME with distributors perhaps selling on your behalf in countries. So what do you do? Well, th there's two different areas you can think about. One is um, if you have people on the ground, distributors, sales agents, and so on, they might be able to help engage. And certainly some of these platforms are trying to offer uh, systems and processes to help brand owners do more. They might be organized locally uh, in local language. You might have to meet with the local team. Some of them are a bit more international. They can do it by Zoom or Teams calls and, and you, can, you can engage with them by email, but it varies. That's, that is one of the major challenges, the sheer variation. So that's the first thing. Um, if you've got people locally, even if they're not your own staff, if they're agents and distributors, they might be able to help get that kind of thing set up for you. Um, secondly, there are um, more resources like the EU SME Help Desk and, and national government attaches from Europe, UK, US, various other organizations. Industry associations also have representatives in Southeast Asia. And so there are, and of course, chambers of commerce, although I totally accept that might be, you might not be a member of a local chamber of commerce, but maybe through your national chamber, there might be a way of connecting. So there are quite a number of routes to get you some on the ground help. Now that at the very starting point can be an information resource. You might say, how can I do this? How can I do that? What suggestions have you got? What problems do other people see in this country or dealing with this platform or that platform? You know, knowledge is always a good thing. Local knowledge is always going to be a good thing. So there are quite a number of sources apart from, of course, hiring an IP firm to actually help you figure this stuff out as well. So use more, not less is, is my suggestion. Right, right. Uh, this makes you think that you must have, obviously, it's not just European companies that are suffering this. Obviously, large American firms, uh, I can think of the large tech firms, but of course, also Southeast Asian companies are also themselves suffering of the, the counterfeiting in their own region. Um, I suppose they're allies in this fight, aren't they, Remy? Is, are these organizations the, the ones that can also help you, given that they are already implemented in the country? Uh, they're, they're a valuable asset. Of course, of course. And I think that the model that we have at Unifab can be, rec be replicated everywhere. Um, Southeast Asia is, is one of them because, of course, um, when you talk about counterfeiting, you actually harm the economic power of your country as well. And the, the, as the Southeast Asian companies are actually suffering from counterfeited, um, from counterfeiting um, because of having those massive platforms uh, that actually, let's say, take care of the problem more or less in an, in an efficient way. Um, and just to, to come back on, on, on maybe what we do at NIFAB and I think in other, uh, let's say, national associations, because UNIFAB is one of the founder, of course, of the, let's say, global anti-counterfeiting uh, group, which is, let's say, the international association gathering um, all national associations fighting against counterfeiting. And Southeast Asian uh, national uh, associations are part of them. And I think they all build up on the same kind of, um, let's say, planning, uh, where e-commerce and online enforcement is actually dealt with through different elements, through direct um, uh, discussion and dialogues with the e-commerce platforms of the region of the country, as uh, Nick said, um, we at Unifab actually have the chance to to have those bigger platforms. Let's say uh, to talk about Indonesia, Bukalapak, Tokopedia, that actually are able uh, via Zoom to uh, keep the link with French companies, but also international companies on their brand protection policies, all the updates, hearing about the companies. In all the discussions we have with the platforms, they are always always saying that. The, the 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 all the elements all the information all the data that can that a company can send to the platform is super super um and needed for them to fill in and to higher up their um let's say the efficiency of their programs of their algorithms to be more proactive uh etc etc so dialogue with those uh, platforms is super important 
Uh, but also, as Nick said, of course, you have some, let's say, um, representatives of your government of your nation that are actually based in Tafsiti Asia. For France, we have a French IP attaché who is based in Singapore and taking care of all the region. So this can actually bring you um, some very good knowledge of how it's happening on the field in terms of online commerce, uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, offline uh, uh, enforcement as well. So those points of contact, those guys, all the guys that you can rely on are actually super important for your company. I see you nodding throughout that, Nick. You, you're agreeing with all of that, that, that it's about engaging with those platforms that they are people that you can work with. They are not the problem. They are just hosting, unfortunately, this, this counterfeited uh, products, but they are happy to, to try to fix the, 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 the problem together. I think some of them are um, to a certain mm -hmm. degree. So I think there is a, uh, well, look, there's a well-trodden pathway. If you look at uh, someone like Amazon or Alibaba, you can see the future for the Southeast Asian platforms. The processes, the, the lawsuits that they've all been through um, are hopefully not going to get replicated uh, for platforms that are genuinely trying to stop the sale of counterfeit goods those that don't have good systems that maybe don't have strong ip uh, focus uh, could get themselves into a lot of trouble under this principles of secondary liability if they don't remove counterfeit goods the platform becomes liable for the sale of them even though they technically are not doing the sale now the systems that enforce that in southeast asia are often not very robust because the legal systems are less mature less advanced they maybe don't have all of the the uh jurisprudence that has come from you know other jurisdictions at some certainly common law countries are allowed to lean on each other's jurisdiction but civil law countries and most of southeast asia is civil law um they cannot so everything has to be done afresh so yes some platforms are, are effective to work with others may be more challenging you know you can see if you look at the 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 reports from the us government and the european commission there are certain ones that are named in there. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's not name and shame here, but if you want to find out, you look at the European Commission's annual report and the US Trade Representative's annual report to see who are the worst platforms, the hardest ones to deal with that have the highest volume of counterfeit goods. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. Sorry, Jamie, you think? If, yeah. yeah, if I may, there is also some, some initiatives in order that, that we can actually follow that I think um, actually illustrating what we are just talking about this sort of collaboration between platforms and right holders that is necessary uh, because right holders are also selling on those platforms etc so if we think about the european mou that helps to facilitate uh, for example those exchanges between let's say an institution um, the right holders and the platforms those initiatives that i think nick you could maybe better talk about it but are replicated also in southeast asia um, in Europe to come back and to make a little bit of trouble. Uh, we, we, we actually have some new laws, so the Digital Services Act that also helps, um, that asks the platform to put in place a number of things. We also have an EU toolbox against counterfeiting that um, is also another initiative and that is helping to, uh, to bring up some guidelines and to facilitate those exchanges between all those worlds. So it's those initiatives can be also an, a real asset um, and for an SME can take part on any of those discussions through the associations or directly it's, it's I think another opportunity to best protect itself. Yes, that's right. And I can, yeah, to, ex to extend that into Southeast Asia, this MOU concept, which is basically a process where IP owners and platforms sign a, it's called an MOU, it's basically a code of conduct for how they're going to work together to efficiently remove, cooperate on law enforcement, deal with repeat infringers, lots of different things can be included in MOUs. Um, one was initiated in Thailand, first of all, of, that was a very basic initial one. Uh, uh, that was early last year, I think it was. The, and then also last year, um, Philippines also put in place an MOU, which was more advanced. That had some actual timelines between which notices uh, could be served and takedowns must happen. It also had some uh, areas around making sure that merchants weren't hidden and didn't keep their identities closed, which is a huge challenge in South 
Southeast Asia. Many merchants can sit, can literally uh, hide themselves behind email addresses and phone numbers, and and you can't find out who they are and where where they are located if they sell counterfeit goods. So the MOU process enables brand owners to an IP uh, and, uh, and these platforms to work together. And they hopefully have a built-in review process so that at the end of the year, the brand owners can say, well, the notice and takedowns are working, but you know, we have merchant identities are still hidden. How do we solve that? And there are ways we can learn from other countries to, uh, to sort of develop those. Now, Indonesia is currently looking at an MOU at the moment. There's a, a relatively heated negotiation going on for the contents of that MOU at the moment. So fingers crossed, Indonesia will sign one at some point in coming months. And then above that, you've got the um, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, which has a secretariat based in Jakarta, which um, operates a little bit like the European Commission. And its member states have mandated it to look at IP issues on e-commerce, and it is exploring what its role with these kind of MOUs should be. And maybe eventually in years to come, a sort of template like the European Union has will be rolled out at sort of ASEAN level across the whole region. And then all of the platforms can then uh, join with common processes, similar timelines, which would address that challenge that Remy mentioned earlier about the fact that many platforms run different systems. Right, yeah, we're starting to get a little bit far away from what an SME can do, but I still think it's very interesting to see how these things are moving, because as companies are thinking about investing, growing in certain regions, obviously, this will provide the stability, the the, the security they're looking for to take that leap, potentially. So obviously, all of this is very welcome. And, and just, to, just to clarify for our listeners, so the MOU is a bit like the first stage in the process of coming to some sort of regional regulation on these things very much mirroring what you said, Remy, the, the, the DMA and DSA regulations that we've had in, in Europe around digital markets. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem is that the, each country has its own legislation uh, in Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. It, Southeast Asia is not a unified uh, legal jurisdiction in the same way that Europe to a degree is. So at the moment, every country is running its own regulations. They're all different. Some of them don't have very strong standards. Others are very well developed. So it's quite a challenge to look at it as a region, but eventually, hopefully, it will get to that point. And if you were to, and you know, push back on this question if you don't think it, it's 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 uh, viable, but if you were to get involved in the region as a country, would you recommend to start in a certain country uh, to to kind of learn the ropes a little bit and test the ground in a certain country or a couple of countries and and avoid one which may be the most difficult and which would actually you know put you off uh, that endeavor? Well, yeah, both I mean, of you that's coming a... on there. Yeah, it's a very good question to ask. Um, typically, companies start with where they've got sales. They want to protect their sales markets. Um, I would definitely say do not start in a country where you'd have no one on the ground selling products. There is no point removing counterfeits and replacing them with more counterfeits. Unless you can sell more products, you're going to spend a huge amount of money on nothing. So start with where you have representation, whether it's a, either a small office or a sales rep or a distributor. Um, obviously, the more developed a country is, the easier this is to do. So, you know, Singapore is the obvious starting point. It's incredibly straightforward to do this kind of work in Singapore. You don't expect to have high volumes of counterfeits there. There'll just be a few, perhaps. Um, then you'd need to start thinking about where you have a market whether it's Malaysia or Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, whichever of those countries you, you've got a, a sales market in or are about to launch in, then you would ally that to saying, OK, well, how do I deal with the counterfeits on the platforms? Am I going to get myself set up with some level of uh, support locally from an IP firm? Am I going to start talking to the local uh, representative organizations in that country that can maybe assist me? Do I start talking directly to these platforms? And maybe some of them will respond to you and say, yes, you've got to do this and this and this. And maybe if you can get the electronic communication system set up, you, you can start work there. Or you could hire one of the one of the bigger international sort of uh, uh, software companies to do these these kind of things. If you can get a low rate for them just to start in one country, it's quite possible to do that as well right that's very good nick i think we're kind of providing now at this stage with a little bit of a to-do list for those smes as they go into the region so i think uh, that's, that's that's great um just to, we've, we've had a few questions i'm just going to move on to those uh Rimi, just to start with you um this question is coming so in france do you have any legislative text under discussion that could protect smes in their online enforcement of ip rights at the moment yes we actually have um so it's a draft law for the moment 
um, that is on the modernization of the fight against counterfeiting, which follows on from a report on the same topic um, and, and attempts to assess uh, the state of counterfeiting in France, uh, the resources available to us today in terms of um, protecting our IP assets, both online and offline, uh, but also the challenges we face. And finally, the, 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 the report proposes some solutions aimed at improving uh, or modernizing the whole. Um, and in the initial report, uh, what is interesting for SMEs is that the French uh, member of parliament that drafted the report um, proposed that they, they, they said that it was important to make it easier for companies to defend their intellectual property rights through um, the creation, for example, of a body um, in the legal form of a public interest grouping or an association to provide advices and assistance to right holders. So what we said, I think, during this, uh, this discussion, uh, but also authorize an existing association or one to be set up uh, specifically for this purpose to take legal action for this purpose. Uh, because, of course, as Nick said, it costs money actually to defend itself. So having maybe a, an association that can be doing this on your behalf can be a solution as well. Um, but also you can think about solutions as, for example, studying the extension of group actions to counterfeiting that enables to lower a little bit the costs that you that, that you will need to do uh, in order to protect yourself on the field again or um, or on the Internet. Mm, okay, interesting. Uh, Nick, just coming back to ASEAN again, we've had a question come in about that. Um, what do you think the timeline is in terms of seeing ASEAN implement some 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 measures that can be helpful? Um, in terms of the, uh, well, the, the ASEAN Secretariat um, have an IP plan uh, which sets out what they're planning to do. Um, unfortunately, that is now, so they run a 10 year IP plan, which is coming to the end of its life in 2024. So it has an e-commerce component to it. And at the moment they are exploring what to do and they are essentially studying what to set out in their next IP plan, which will start at the beginning of 2025. So over the course of the next year, the more they hear about, the more that, that they're kind of, they study this area and the more people talk to them, that will help set the agenda for the next 10 years for ASEAN. So we're kind of in a transition phase at the moment. I would fully expect that their 2025 action plan has e-commerce right at the top of it as one of the top priorities to be dealt with across the region. So you're, you're making a bit of a call to arms, no? For everyone to engage it's and to- Partly that, and, and you, the more people that talk to them, the better, yeah. Yeah, so Remy, uh, get out there quickly and uh, go and talk as, as Unifab. Um, yeah, great. Okay, and so uh, Remy, just come back to you. So what are the, the current contemporary challenges uh, your member companies are facing um, when talking about counterfeiting online? Can you give us some, some concrete examples of what, what they're facing at the moment? Yeah, of course. I think we have been focusing a lot on, um, let's say, traditional e-commerce platforms um, but one let's say current and contemporary challenge is of course protecting yourself on platforms or digital players such as social media uh, if we think about tiktok for example and the business model of tiktok where you have actually some um, live videos or even on let's say instagram where you have some lives that are posted uh, it is quite difficult and it's another challenge to actually have the possibility to monitor to identify and to notify the content that is infringing your rights um, during a live sale uh, you're not all day long in front of your of your phone the even the service provider that um, can do this work for you is not uh, in front of uh, instagram or TikTok all day long so it's super super com it can be complicated and this is kind of a further challenge that we actually um, anticipate a second one that I want to, 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 to draw your attention on is um, all the promotion of counterfeits that is made, and it's a bit linked with the first one, but by the influencers. Um, I don't know if you followed a bit, but in France, we had a, a very extensive discussion, um, um, a regulatory discussion around this, um, around this topic. We have a new law that just has been adopted two weeks ago on this topic as well, in order to make sure that influencers um, as having bigger bigger audiences are as targeting um, young people as well um, as having a big influence have also a role to play in terms of awareness but they also need to be let's say made aware of their rights in terms of content creators uh, but also 
their uh, obligations in terms of you do, you do not have the right to actually promote or make the promotion of illicit things and counterfeiting is one of them. So um, we're quite happy of the law um, and I think it's, uh, it sets up quite the scene um, in Europe, but I think it will come up uh, uh, in Southeast Asia as well. Um, it is the course of the, uh, of the history, I think. So it's, it's important to look at those challenges already. Yeah, ultimately, this is a bit of a technological uh, challenge as well. Isn't it? I mean, the counterfeiting, I'm sure, is as old as time. And since, yeah. you know, since people have been creating things, people have been copying it and making poorer versions of it. Uh, but now we're facing social media. As you say, these influencers have massive audiences. They can send you through to a specific link very quickly. Um, and yes, of course, I mean, they're, they're starting to dip their toes into this, these influencers as well. And are not they're very familiar with the responsibilities they hold. So yeah. very promising to hear, yes, that, uh, that France has taken a, a step forward on this. Um, just in terms of the uh, layout of the of, of the region, uh, Nick, just to come to a, a last question. We talked about this already a little bit. Uh, you, you're based in, in Indonesia. Um, from your experience, um, are things improving for companies over the last few years? So we've had this explosion. COVID meant a lot more stuff is being built online. I, I imagine that the merchants, the platforms are starting to come to terms with this explosion. Uh, are you optimistic about the about the future? Yes, as I say, uh, there is a pathway that these platforms are all on. Um, it rather depends on, um, a, well, there are a series of factors that will influence how fast they develop. One is the political motivations in the countries in question, and those wax and wane, you know, there are places like the Philippines, which over the last sort of 10 years, frankly, have done an awful lot to improve their enforcement infrastructure. Uh, it's, you know, something that the, the IP office has been very focused on. They built a special team to focus on it, and they've had the will to do it. Um, it's been a bit more of a challenge in a country like Indonesia, which in terms of scale is far larger. So, you know, any country that is inordinately large, like, you know, Indi India, China, Indonesia, these kind of huge countries, things are automatically harder to, to do. Um, so, and, and the legal structure here is maybe not as well developed as it is elsewhere. Um, things come and go in other countries. Uh, Malaysia in years past had a number of political problems, but those seem to be gone now. And people are very optimistic that that will start to improve its IP infrastructure. Thailand is stuck in a sort of zone in between governments at the moment. We mm. are kind of worried about whether the uh, efforts to keep improving their IP infrastructure are going to continue because you know, the political things. But Beyond that, there's the international political environment. So the fact that I mentioned that there are IP attaches working for different governments in the region, the fact that the European Union publishes reports and so does the US government, it's really important that this continued political dialogue to improve the quality of IP protection continues. If, if people lose interest, lose focus and say, oh, I can't be bothered, then yeah, the, the systems will not improve as quickly as, as we hope they, will, they should do. Mm. Great, thank you very much. A slight optimistic with reservation note at the end there, Nick. Uh, that, that's great. Um, uh, we're, we're coming to the end today, guys. I'd just like to thank you both very much indeed. Uh, and a yeah, massive thank you for, for giving us your time today. Thank you very much for sharing all of your knowledge with our with our listeners. I think it's been very valuable for SMEs. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping just before we we, we finish for today. So uh, a big thank you also to Unifab, uh, Vimy, uh, and, and their support in making today's uh, vodcast possible. Um, if you missed any of our vodcasts, We'll be posting all of this on our YouTube channel, uh, which is our new IP Espresso uh, channel. Um, and as I mentioned at the start of the, the, the show, if you want more information on how to protect your innovations uh, in Southeast Asia, do go to our website, which is www.sea-iphelpdesk.eu. Um, you can submit your questions on our, uh, to our IP experts, such as Nick, uh, through that platform. Um, and, and also download a lot of fact sheets uh, about intellectual property in the region, which could be very useful to you as you look to, to, to go there as a company. Um, finally, we'd also love to know what you thought about this podcast. We're, we're going to hold a whole series of these going forward. We want to improve them. So we're very much keen to hear your feedback. Uh, there'll be a QR code that will appear at the end of the show. Do use that, please, to, to provide that. Um, now, our next episode will be broadcast at the beginning of September. Uh, and will be announced on our social media channels. Um, that's it. We hope you enjoy the break over the summer. Uh, look forward to seeing you in September. Uh, thank you once again to our guests. Nick, Amy, thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you. bye for now. Thank you.